Hello, this is Jim O'Keefe, and welcome to this Code Rage 10 session, FireDAC in MongoDB, an introduction. This session was mostly designed by Dmitry Arafev, the guy that designed and built FireDAC. Um, I've made a few additions and a few tweaks in order to have this session fit well with the next session, which is a more advanced session on FireDAC in MongoDB. So this session's introduction to MongoDB, introduction to the way FireDAC works with MongoDB, in the next session, we're going to build on what we've learned here with some more advanced topics. So the plan is we're going to do an overview of MongoDB, talk about some of the new JSON and BSON RTL support, look at um, the FireDAC MongoDB API wrapping classes and data sets, and then do your questions and answers. So real quick, MongoDB is a leading NoSQL JSON document-oriented, highly scalable, simple setup open source free database. Long list there. Uh, NoSQL is the class of databases because it doesn't use SQL. It it's a, uses a different way of querying the data. It stores uh, documents. So instead of records, you have documents. And these, record, these documents are JSON, or actually they're BSON, which is a binary representation of JSON. There's slight, some slight differences in there. And it's designed to be highly scalable. So we see there on the right, we have a, a list of some vocabulary words, some differences. So instead of a table, we have a collection. Instead of a record, we have a document. So the, the big differences there. Uh, MongoDB runs on OS 10, Windows, Linux, and Solaris. And there's a couple other uh, server databases that also supports, but those are the big ones. Uh, someone usually asks, well, can I embed this on my Android device? Supposedly there's some hacks that you can do that, but it's not really designed for that. That's not the purpose of MongoDB. MongoDB is designed to be on a server and have high availability and high scaling. So why would you want to use MongoDB? Uh, oftentimes people talk about how fast it is and it's designed for with performance in mind. It's designed with scalability in mind. It's easy to scale across many computers. It's cluster friendly. So it's got a high availability for write heavy operations. So if you're collecting a lot of data, it's really easy to work with. It's able to deal with really large data sets. One of the things that's kind of unique about it though, is that it has location-based query support. So if you have data with latitude and longitude, you can actually do queries based on that latitude and longitude and get distances between locations and stuff like that. It's also schema-less. So there's no enforced schema. Now, Sometimes you'd be like, if you come from an RDBMS background, you'd be like, wait a second, that seems like chaos. Well, it kind of is. Uh, the reality is that you're going to have a collection. The things in the collection are going to have a lot of similar fields in there. Okay, so you're not going to have just completely random stuff in a collection. Or at least you shouldn't. That would be bad because then you wouldn't be able to find the stuff you're looking for. But you're going to have similar things in there. Now, it makes sense when you have a regular data. Okay, so if you normally in a regular database, RDBMS, you're going to use normalization, right? So you're going to break apart things and put them in different call, different tables so it's normalized. But let's say, for example, you have a product catalog, and in that product catalog, you have a car and clothes. Now, cars and clothes have completely different things that describe them, but they also have a number, number of similarities, right? They have a product ID, they have a price uh, vendor, so on and so forth. So some similarities but a lot of things are differences. So if you were to put that in an RDBMS, you'd be trying to normalize that data out into different tables and it would get complicated. And what you end up with in that situation is an impedance mismatch where it's like, this data makes sense as a single document. But as soon as I start breaking it apart into different tables, it no longer makes sense. The data becomes scattered. So that's one place that MongoDB really shines is when you need to have that uh, irregular data all stored in document format. So MongoDB also is non-relational. There's no referential integrity. You can have references. You can say, hey, this record is someplace else, but you're never doing a join between two different collections. So that's another big difference. So real quick, it's worth stating this specifically. MongoDB is a different kind of database. Okay, It's better for certain usages and worse for others. Um, you're not going to say, hey, I'm going to go through and replace all my existing RDB messes with MongoDB and now it'll be fast. Now it'll be scalable. That's not going to work. There's some advantages to MongoDB and there's some advantages to RDB messes. So um, 
there may be a situation where you were using an RDBMS where you should have been using a document-based solution like MongoDB. In that case, you could go back and re-architect it and use MongoDB and take some advantage of that. But if you're using something that required uh, complex transactions, referential integrity, if you have a lot of SQL you're writing against it, those things no longer work with MongoDB. So switching to MongoDB means giving up all of that. If this isn't about being a better database, it's about being a, a different tool to be in your tool belt for when you need data storage. So I talked a little bit about sharding or horizontal scaling. What this is gives you the ability to take a single collection and divide it up over multiple shards or multiple computers. And so this allows you to store uh, large data in number of smaller databases. So we see here, we have one collection that's one terabyte and it's been split into four shards. And so that single collection is stored on four different shards or four different databases. And they, so we have four physical different databases, but they together make a single logical database. So this uh, improves throughput as well as increases the amount of data that can be stored. So for installing MongoDB, it's pretty straightforward. If you go to mongodb.org slash downloads, you can download the 32-bit or 64-bit version of MongoDB for the platform you're working with. The FireDAC support we have works with OS 10 and Windows. So we don't have Solaris or Linux support, but you can install MongoDB in either of those platforms and connect to it. It's worth noting the default environment location for the data is C colon data DB on Windows. Uh, I don't remember what it is on uh, OS 10. I installed this on Windows. It doesn't tell you that anywhere in the process. It doesn't ask you where you want the data to be stored, etc. Also, once you've installed it, the database isn't running. To run it, you have to go to a command prompt and go to the folder where you installed it for in the bin directory and run MongoD. And you can pass options in there if you want to change the data location, et cetera, or make it a service. So once you do that, then it's running. You can press Control-C to uh, close, terminate the database and have it closed properly, or you can install it as a service. So there's tutorials available there. There's two links for you. You can check out uh, ones on MongoDB's website and the ones in our doc wiki. So I've opened an administrative command prompt here in the folder that MongoDB is installed into in the bin directory. MongoD is the uh, what I want to run the daemon that runs in the background. Now I've created a backslash data folder with a DB and log folder in there. And so now I do is create a config file d.cfg. And this just specifies the uh, system log folder. So it's the data log and the storage path. That's the default there. Once you've done that, then you can uh, install MongoDB as a service. So if you don't want to install it as a service, you can just run MongoD, and this runs it in uh, uh, application mode, Control-C to terminate it. But if you want to install it as a service, then it's MongoD uh, config, C colon backslash, this needs to be an absolute path. Mongo config, install. There we go. We've installed it as a service, and so now I can do net start MongoD. Oh, it's on MongoDB. There we go. MongoDB service has started successfully. There we go. Now MongoDB is running as a service on Windows, and you can work with it from there. So pretty straightforward. It's all covered in the documentation there. So let's talk about MongoDB documents. Really, no SQL means no schema. Uh, a document is a collection and may have any sort of dynamic structure you want. Uh, they, like I mentioned before, documents in a collection still normally have some common elements. So if it's a, um, a product catalog collection, right, a product collection, you're going to have a product ID or a price or something along those lines. You're not going to stick a employee in the product collection. That doesn't make any sense. There's nothing in common between an employee and a product. So all documents are BSON or binary JSON. What that adds is it's got more data types than JSON does. So JSON doesn't really have um, a lot of different data types or strict data types, whereas BSON does. It has uh, lots of different data types to choose from. 
Also, because it's binary, it's more concise, which means for faster reading and writing and faster navigation. So a document is any valid BSON object. Uh, each document has a unique underscore ID value pair. So that's the default primary key. Everything gets this underscore ID value. Uh, any document keys can be indexed. So by default, ID is indexed, but you can index any key you want to. And any document key can be used to find a document. So since there's no requirement that every document has any specific keys, if you query for a document that doesn't have that key, you're not going to find it. You can replace an entire document in full or update an individual part of that document. The transactionality of MongoDB is limited to that single document update. So if you are uh, updating a document you updated, that's your transaction. You can't have a transaction over multiple documents, over multiple co uh, collections, etc. So in that regard, each document operation is atomic. You either write successfully or you don't write successfully. So the new RTL, BSON, and JSON port support that's been added in Seattle gives you some great functionality for working with the BSON and JSON documents that come from MongoDB. So we have the uh, new JSON text writer and BSON writer as well as a reader. And we also have this new fluent style uh, object builder, which makes it really easy to build a document uh, in a, it's called the fluent format. And so it's where you are a lot less code really is what it comes down to. And it makes it more readable in the process. And then we also have a JSON iterator, which is a uh, very fast forward only JSON iterator. It doesn't go through and parse the entire JSON document out. It just reads it going forward. There's no going back. So it's great for just uh, ripping through and reading through a document really quickly. Now, MongoDB specifically, we do have a Mongo document, and this represents a MongoDB document and provides uh, additional functionality on top of just the idea of reading JSON. So it, it understands the specifics of what it is to be a MongoDB document. So for FireDAC, we have a new driver, a new, it's called Mongo, and you can point it to a server. Now, that FireDAC Mongo driver MongoDB driver doesn't support SQL things like commands and FD query and FD tables. So a number of these things that we're used to be willing to use with other data sets, other databases with FireDAC do not work with the new Mongo driver because there is no SQL in MongoDB, right? It's called NoSQL. Uh, also the transaction doesn't make sense either because everything is atomic or all document rights are atomic, but there's nothing beyond that. You can't create a larger transaction. So no need for transactions. You do still use the FD connection component. That's how you connect to the database. And then we have a number of new wrapper, wrapper classes as well as some new components that you can work as well. Also notice that you can use the local SQL so you can actually get a result set from MongoDB into a data set, a Mongo data set, and then use local SQL to query against that. So if you still like your SQL and you want to do something with SQL and you can't figure out how to do it with the Mongo query, you can read it all into memory and then write SQL against it. That's really cool. That's a really great feature of FireDAC because it has this high level abstraction. That's something you're not going to get with other MongoDB implementations. Uh, you can also use the batch move to move data between MongoDB and other databases. So uh, to create a document, you here's this is the code that you would use in the MongoDB console. So uh, it's not, this isn't uh, object Pascal or C++ code. This is MongoDB code. This is their query language that you would use. And you would type uh, DB, which is the name of the database, restaurants, which is the collection. And then the operation you're doing here is an insert. And then you pass in this JSON document here. And so it's a name, address, and you notice the address has got an embedded JSON object within that. With the ad, So it's the address object. And then you notice coordinates is actually an array of data within there. So that's a, some of the things you can do with MongoDB is it has this uh, concept of embeddable objects and embeddable arrays. And so that's how you get around the fact that you can't do joins in MongoDB. Instead of uh, normalizing your data out and then joining it back together in MongoDB, instead you embed it all into this complex document. So uh, the ID pair is automatically added. So notice we didn't specify the ID underscore ID value. That gets added automatically when we do an insert. Everything gets a unique ID in the database. 
You can also specify a write concern, and this will say what MongoDB guarantees the end of a write operation. So you can do uh, write concerns on databases, collections, or connections. Um, for more information, you can check out the MongoDB documentation there, and it's just a way of uh, further defining what you want it to guarantee for you. And then you can also do batch insertion, similar to the FireDAC array DML. So for reading data from MongoDB, instead of using SQL, instead of saying select star from restaurants, you would say db.restaurants. So db is the database, restaurants is the collections. Dot find is operation. So we're finding, in this case, with an empty set, we're finding everything. So this is going to give us all the documents out of the restaurant's collection. The second line there you see is going to give us just the restaurants with an address, a street address of 2 Avenue. So something worth noting here, first of all, it's address drop street. It's because address was an embedded object. And so the address has a um, field, the address object has a field within it called street. And so this is referencing the uh, address dot street a value of set to Avenue. So this is a JSON document here we're passing in that defines what we're looking for. So it has it's this flexible selection criteria language, which is a JSON document. And then you can actually define this all together. You can define the projection, the match, and the sort. So there's a syntax you can go into that uh, defines all of this, but we actually simplify it through FireDAC, which I'll show you a little bit. The projection is the select. So instead of saying by default, what we're doing here, this is getting a select um, star, select asterisk, where we're getting all the columns. But the projection is where you can change and say, I only want these columns. The match is the where clause. And so that address.street colon to avenue, that's the match. And so there we're specifying we only want records that match that address. And then we can also provide a sort, which is similar to an order by where we specify what sort we want to apply to the data that's coming back. All right. As mentioned before, there are no joins. And when you do a find, what you actually do is get a cursor back. And that cursor points to the JSON documents, the MongoDB documents. So let's talk a little bit about the architecture within MongoDB. You have a connection to MongoDB, and in that connection, you have databases. So there can be multiple databases within the connection. Then the connect database can contain collections, and the collections contain documents. Now, important note here is a collection only exists when it contains documents. Okay, so you cannot have an empty collection. If you have an empty collection, you don't have a collection. A document is made up of fields with types and values. And sometimes those values can be uh, other embedded objects or arrays, it's worth noting. So let's look at some of the uh, object Pascal specific wrapping classes we have. So we have the uh, Mongo environment ENV, which is the root utility class that we use for a couple things you'll see in some of the example code we get to. We also have the connection. The connection is your connection to the installation of MongoDB. Within that connection, you have databases, the tmongo database, and the database has collections, tmongo collection. So this is where you do your CRUD operations is on the collection. Then you'll get back documents or you'll create documents to put in. And that's through the tmongo document. And then we have our fluent style builders for the inserts, updates, queries, and pipelines, et cetera. So, uh, there's your example of your code you would use. So you have your FD connection component on the form that you define the connection to the MongoDB database. You specify the IP address and the driver ID. Once you connect to it, you can cast from the FD connection to get a Mongo connection. And then from there, you can get your tmongo environment. So here we see some code to do an insert without using the Fluent Builders. So we see here we're creating uh, a new document, our ODOC, and then we have that reference to the document that we then need to free at the end. So we build the document here, and then we add names, an embedded object here. The address is an embedded object with a street, and then it has an embedded array, the coordinates, which we've add values to, in the array, in the object, 
And then when we're done with the ODOC, we've built it up. At this point, we can then insert it into the test database within the restaurant's collection, insert the ODOC. And when we're done, we free that document. Here's the Fluent Builder. So it's very similar, except that we don't ever manage our document ourselves here. We just insert it. And in inserting it, we pass in, we create the object we're inserting right there on the spot. So same, the syntax is the same for building it up, except you'll notice at the bottom, we end the insert and then exec execute that. So for querying, we are going to get back an iMongo cursor interface, which represents our MongoDB cursor. So here we see the find getting all the documents and then we're iterating through it there and putting them into a memo. And then the second example here, we're gonna get filtered and sorted documents using the Fluent style. So again, we're using uh, F connection to the test database, to the restaurants collection, we're doing a find and notice that we're continuing that on the next line. We're doing say, I wanna match, give me address has a value of street. And then we're doing a sort on that where we're gonna sort on name as true. And at the end, we're gonna iterate through that and put it into the memo, okay? And then for reading the data, we're gonna, this is how we use the iterator here. We can actually do a next recurse, which allows us to go into a nested object return returns us back to the parent object or an array and then keys and types as allows us to read uh, content of an element so so here we see we're using the recurse to go into the nested object going through that object getting the values out so we see we get out the first coordinate the second coordinate out of there so this is the way you would find if we have coordinates if we do we go into the coordinates and then pull the values out there's a lot more to MongoDB you can do as well. You can uh, update collections, you can delete values from collections, you can aggregate and pipelines that allows you to deal with data in different ways. But now let's talk about data sets. So typically, you when you're working with MongoDB and other tools, you're gonna get back a cursor to a bunch of um, documents. And those documents don't have a schema, so there's nothing that says they have to have anything in common. The reality is you're gonna have some similarities. And so we have the concept of being able to work with data sets. These are gonna be data sets like we're used to working with, with a few differences. So the, as I mentioned, the problem is MongoDB database doesn't have a schema, but a data set does, right? You have fixed columns with data types in a schema. So the expectation is, is that we expect that most data there is gonna be some similarity and that the same named um, fields are going to have same values from document to document. So the solution is we're going to scan, or it automatically happens. It automatically scans through the result set, the first number and number of documents, and builds a common schema that represents that. So it's conceivable you may have some um, documents later on in the cursor that are different, and they wouldn't show up in. It wouldn't build a schema to represent those and those fields could be left out. Then this also also had support for nested objects and arrays, which is really quite cool that you can do that. So here's an example. This is the collection of documents we get back, the cursor of documents we get back from the database. And it converts this to the data set you see here. So if you notice, the first one here doesn't have a value for fat, but the second one does. Okay, so this is a good example of very mismatched records in here, right? The only thing that's common is a name, but they're totally different kinds of objects. So we have a human, a fruit, and a car all within the same collection. But because they have different values, so uh, we have a job, a human has a job, a fruit has fat, and a car has an engine. Now, in the data set, we just null the values that we don't have. So a fruit has a null fat, or a fruit has a null job and a null engine. Now, some of the things that extend this data sets are the fact that the nested objects have a field type of uh, ADT and the nested arrays have a field type of data set. And so we see here an, 
and it has unlimited nesting levels. So we see here an example where we see the uh, field type of address is the ADT because it's a nested object. And then within the address, we have the coordinates has data type of data set because it is a nested data set, it's a nested array. So just like I'm working with other databases, we have two different data sets you can work with. You have the Mongo data set, which is similar to the uh, FD table, and then the Mongo query, which is similar to FD query. So the FD Mongo data set attaches to a Mongo cursor, and you specify the connection, which is the FD connection, and you specify the database and collection name. This is the path to where the collection's at. It scans the first two times the value of fetch objects.record set size to create that automatic schema in order to define the data set. So if you find you have some documents that aren't getting represented properly, you could change the sort so that they fall into that, that scanning it range, or you can increase the size of the scanning range. So the Mongo query, on the other hand, is used to query to get the data from the collection. So you can do the query two different ways. The easiest way is to use the Q project, Q match, and Q sort properties. And again, the project is like the select, the match is like the where, and the sort is like the order by. So the minimum you need to provide is the match probably to specify which um, documents you want to get back from the collection. Or you can use the query property, which allows you to use the Mongo query builder only at runtime in order to define or build up that query that you want to use. Also have a Mongo pipeline, which I'm not going to show you an example of. Hopefully in the next advanced session, we can get into that. That allows you to use an aggregate to produce a cursor. So this is a little sample I made to show the um, way you can build queries and how to work with the embedded data sets. So we have our FD connection on here, and it specifies the driver of Mongo. We're connecting to a local database. You can go in the connection properties and see all the properties. Um, if you want to, you can download this with the URL that I'm going to paste here on the screen in post-production. Hopefully it's there right now. So the FD connection is what the main thing you use to connect to the database. But if you remember, we're going to use this uh, FT Mongo connection. And this is what we're going to use to uh, access the collections in the databases and stuff like that. So these are defined as private variables. And we just cast right here after we connect to the database. And make sure on destroy, you want to make sure you close the FD connection to your Mongo database so that it cleans up that cursor. And we also get the... Um, environment, team Mongo environment right here. And that comes from the F connection. So the, there's a button here, load data, and this is going to just load the sample and data in here. And it goes out to this JSON file and spins through it and loads that data in here. But the magic, if you will, is here on the button open click. Let me show you the designer first here. We have three edit boxes, the match, the sort, and the projection. And so on open, first thing we do is gonna close the query if it's already open, and then we clear the, the field defs. And this is because the projection changes or could change between runs. And so we may or may not have the same number of columns, the same column show up. So then we set the Q match, Q sort, and Q project properties of the query. So there's two ways to access the query. You can access the query property, which use the query builder, or you can specify JSON text on the QMatch, QSort, and QProject. And we just get those from the editors here. Then we open it. Now we look in the query results and we see if we got back the address.cord field or the grades field. Now we know, because we know our schema, that these are uh, nested data sets. We could instead look at the field type to see if it is uh, the type to be a nested data set as well. And then if it's a nested data set, we would uh, assign it here to the uh, another data set. So we have two different data sets we use here to show the embedded grids. So we just cast that field as a T data set field and get the next data set that way. Okay, that's really all there is to it. So let's go ahead and run this. The other great thing about this sample is it shows you how to uh, how these different parts of the query work. So I'm gonna go ahead and open this now. I've already loaded the data into the data set. So into the database so the collection's fully populated. And it's a, it's a bunch of restaurants here. So right now we're looking for um, matches with an address.zip code. So you see address is an embedded object here with these uh, 
properties inside of it here, these fields inside of it. And so we're looking at the zip code of the address. Okay, so that's the dot here. And so those all match. And then we're looking for the cuisine is not equal to Italian. So this is a little different syntax than we saw earlier uh, because we're looking for not equal to instead of equal to. And so everything here is not equal to Italian. Now, uh, two things. First of all, you notice the cuisine is not in quotes, but address.zip code is. Typically, you put things in quotes, but I did this intentionally here because the quotes are only required if there's a dot here. So if I took the dot off here, that would give me an error message. But since there's no dot, you can actually get away with not including the quotes. But then here, this is using the diff a different kind of notation. So I can do not equals to, I can also do equals, and this just gives me Italian. But the simpler notation that you would typically use for equals is just to go like this. And that is going to be, behave exactly the same. But, um, oops. The reason I had to show the other one is because it shows you how to do the, the not equals to. And then if you're doing numeric fields, you can do greater than, less than. And there's other operators as well, in there as well. So that's the match. If I take the match out completely, it gives me back every uh, document in the collection. So here's the sort. Right now, it's sorted by cuisine. Oh, let's, uh, let's leave that shut off completely. So it's sorted by cuisine inverted. So Vietnamese, Cambodian, Malaysian is on top. If I change this to one, it will sort it by cuisine ascending. So that's the two possible values, and we can sort it by um, address.zip code. And now we've sorted it by address.zip code. So apparently we have a null zip code here. And we can take that off and it will be completely unsorted. And this last one here is where you change the projection. So if you remember, uh, match is like the where, sort is like the order by, and then projection is like the select, the very part, oh, first part of your SQL statement. And this is where you specify what columns you want. So the default is it gives you all the columns. So if I remove this, we'll get all the columns here including the underscore ID. So everything has an underscore ID column. But if you don't want the underscore ID column, you have to specify right here with a zero on it. So if I take that part off there, we'll see, we still get the ID column, but we only get the cuisine and grade, or address cuisine and grades. So see, address cuisine, grades. If I take uh, grades out, we see now it's gone. And it doesn't show up down here. But, um, oops, that's all well, things gone. Okay, so we'll just do this. So uh, if I take this out and make it empty set, we get everything. But then if I put the um, ID zero there, then it goes away. Okay, so the, the, if you want to hide the ID, you do, do use that. Otherwise, you specify uh, only the ones you want. Also within here, I'll show you this grid understands that this is a nested data set. And if I double click here on the ellipsis, it brings up and shows me the values that are shown down here at the bottom. So you don't have to break it out into a separate grid if you want to, but I thought that looked cool. So that's why I did it that way. Okay. Hello, and thanks for joining. During this video, we'll take a look at ER Studio support for MongoDB, which began with ER Studio XE6. Now, I know one of the questions you're asking is how does a tool that's been used for relational database modeling go about modeling a NoSQL platform like MongoDB? Well, we went ahead and used slightly different notation, and we'll take a look at that as soon as we get into the data model. But first, let's go ahead and start by reverse engineering a MongoDB database. We'll begin by launching ER Studio Data Architect, and we'll reverse engineer MongoDB the same way we'd reverse engineer, say, Oracle. Let's go to File and New, Reverse Engineer, and we'll choose the native direct connection. Once you've done that, you'll see MongoDB in the drop down menu alongside of Oracle, SQL Server, and these other supported platforms. We'll enter the data source host name and our database credentials here. Clicking Next will connect to that MongoDB. And we'll want to go ahead and choose a specific database out of that MongoDB to reverse engineer. 
so library in this case. And then what type of collections do we want to pull in, user and or system? In this case, we'll just choose user. On page three, we can be very specific as to which collections we want to bring into our model. So if we wanted to remove patron, for instance, we could unselect it from the page here. Although we'll want to bring in all three of these for our example. Page four, you'll see some grayed out options because they're relational database specific. However, you can still infer domains and choose a layout option. Let's stick with orthogonal for this example. And once it's complete, we'll have both a logical and physical model. We're not too interested in the logical model because it's database independent. So let's go to the physical MongoDB model here and take a look at what we have here. We'll slightly uh, spread these objects out a little bit here and we'll take a look at the model. At this point, you're likely asking two questions. Where did the address and checkout objects come from? And what do these relationships mean? We'll take a look at the MongoDB JSON code in a moment to better answer that question. But basically, MongoDB collections have the ability to embed other collections within them. And that's what these relationships are referring to. In the case of patron to address, what we have here is a collection patron that embeds an array of address collections. So we, the star on the array on the address side refers to that array, where within publisher, we only have one instance of address, and therefore you see a one in place of a star. Let's open up the JSON in a text file and take a look. First, let's look at the insert statement for patron. If we look inside of this insert statement, we see address and we see two instances of addresses and therefore we have an array of embedded address collections where in publisher we also see address but we only see one instance of an address and therefore we have a single address collection within publisher now in the code you'll also notice that the address the section of address code is slightly different between publisher and patron in patron, we have these square brackets that don't exist up in publisher. ER Studio Data Architect reads those square brackets and realizes that there's an array of embedded collections within the object that contains those brackets, and therefore lays down the relationship line that we see between patron and address. Now you also see typical IE crow's feet notation in this model. And that's because collections can also reference other collections. An example of that, I think a good example of that is between publisher and book. If we look at the book insert statement, you see that it references the publisher ID. And of course you would read this relationship the same way you'd re read a relationship in a relational model with IE notation a publisher may have one or many books associated with them. And that's it. That's how ER Studio Data Architect supports MongoDB. So for learning resources, mongodb.org has some great documentation to help you get a better understanding of MongoDB, how it works and how to work with it. You can also check out the MongoDB documents in the doc wiki. We have a number of samples available in Object Pascal um, that ship with Seattle. You can take a look at those. And then here's two books that I'm recommending here. There's Instant MongoDB, which is a great smaller book if you don't want to read a lot, but you just want to get the crux of MongoDB. That's a good one there. It's by Packet Press. And then MongoDB, The Definitive Guide by O'Reilly is much more substantial book if you want to really dive in and get a better understanding of working with MongoDB. Also, check out the next code rage session that's coming up here next. But first we're going to do Q and a, and here's some more resources as far as how to get in touch with us. If you have questions, comments, or concerns, there's our email addresses. You can use the, uh, FireDAC forum 
or file bug reports if you encounter things and quality.embarcadero.com. Thank you very much. Okay, so there's a couple questions that have come in already, but if you have more questions about MongoDB, go ahead and enter them into the question panel, man, the question panel here in GoToWebinar, and we'll get them answered for you. Uh, first question in here is, if the MongoDB document has multiple elements, say, two address um, street, two avenue, three avenue, does the find address street to avenue scan all the addresses okay so i think pat's asking if the um the doc if the document has an array of addresses so it has uh multiple like for example we had the grades and the coordinates in there there is a query i didn't even get into this that lets you query to see if an array contains uh, those items so I, we didn't get into that but what you would do is you would instead do does this address array contain an address where street is second avenue and they would find those uh, scott pointed out that the syntax looks like parse queries could we use mongodb driver with back into the service so there's a reason that it looks like parse queries and that's because parse and kinvi and a lot of the other back into the service providers use mongodb behind the scenes mongodb is one of the top uh NoSQL database driver, databases out there right now, and no, no, NoSQL databases are the preferred data storage for most backend the service providers. Now, could you use a MongoDB driver with bat with a backend the service provider? No. The reason is is you're not connecting directly to MongoDB. You're connecting to Parse or Kinvi through their API. So, the queries may be able to use the same syntax as far as uh, the way you're defining the match and, the, and, and such. Those may be the same, but it's still going through parse or kinvi. So you're not able to just connect to it directly as if it was a MongoDB database because it, you're not connecting directly to MongoDB database. Think of it kind of like if you um, had an Oracle backend database and you set up a data snap middle tier and then you're building your client application. Your client application wouldn't use an Oracle driver to connect to the Oracle backend database. It would use the DataSnap provider to connect to the DataSnap middle tier. So the backend service providers are the middle tiers that are brokering the data from the MongoDB database, as well as other things like the ability to push notifications and such. So uh, hopefully that answers your question, Scott. Uh, how does MongoDB hook collections like publishers, books, unidirectionally or bidirectionally? So I'm not sure what you mean by unidirectionally or bidirectionally, but if you, in the example where we saw um, ER Studio modeling that, that, which I put that in there because it was nice because it showed some more advanced data models, which makes sense, you know, using ER Studio. But the every document has that ID underscore or underscore ID reference on it, and the um, the way you reference what, from one document to another is by in that document you have object parentheses quotes and then the value of that id and so that means you're referencing another document now there is no referential integrity there's nothing that's going to enforce that and there's no joins so you can't ever do a join and say um, i want to get this document and then go get the value of the document it references can't do that instead you would go through and grab the data you the documents you wanted from one collection and then go look for the values of the in the next collection based on the results of the first collection. So hopefully that's what you mean by um, uh, hook publishers and books unidirectionally or bidirectionally. So hopefully this was uh, educational as far as the fundamentals of MongoDB and hopefully you understand that MongoDB is, is not a, an upgrade or a replacement for a database like a SQL Server or MySQL or Interbase but is instead a different kind of database that you could use um, to in it for solving specific problems. So there's, I realized as I'm learning more about MongoDB, there's been times in the past that I've been storing data that in an RDBMS that didn't need to be in an RDBMS. It didn't have uh, referential integrity. It didn't necessarily have a consistent uh, schema from record to record. 
and uh, it didn't really benefit from normalization and, and relationships and stuff like that. So that's where MongoDB comes in really handy is when you have data like that. So Walter's saying, if I understand correctly, I have to replicate information like state, country, et cetera, inside every document instead of having a, a related table. Is that to so? So yes, if you, for example, exact, like, exactly like states, in an RDBMS, you would have a, a table that has states in it, and you would, in other tables, reference that state. Now, in most systems I've worked with, if I have a simple lookup like, for example, states, I actually make the states column the primary key and then reference that so that I'm actually including the state so that when I query that, I query the table. I don't have to go join it back to that states table to see that number one is uh, Alabama, right? Because that just is e extra overhead at the, in the query process. So essentially that, what you're doing in MongoDB, you could have a collection of MongoDB of states or you could have a collection called lookups and you could have a lookup type or something like that. I don't know. There's a few ways you could do it. So you could enforce this in your program. So that's one thing that's different about MongoDB versus an RDBMS. In an RDBMS, there is the DBA enforces this data model, they enforce the behavior of the database. In a NoSQL, like MongoDB, the programmer enforces the way the database behaves. Your program has to enforce that behavior. So if you want to say you can only use the 50 states, then you can enforce that in the program. Now you can enforce that by putting those in a collection in MongoDB, or you can enforce that by putting that in just a array in your program and hard coding it. However you want to enforce that's fine, but there is no nothing in MongoDB that says I can only have a value for state that comes from this other table over there. There's no referential integrity. So Stephen's asking, I think that there's no joins explained it. There is no similar concept of linking tables. Correct. Yeah, there's no nothing that says this table is linked. Now you can, like I said, you can reference that object by referencing its object ID, but MongoDB is like, whatever you say, man, I don't care. <laughs> it's just storing that document. And that document can be whatever you want to put in it. You can have a collection of cars that's got each document describes a car, and you can insert a fruit into that collection. And MongoDB is going to be like, sure, no problem. And the only thing that's going to be similar between the car, one of the car documents and the fruit document is the fact that it has an underscore ID. And if you look for the, if you go through and say, give me uh, all the cars that have an engine of this or, you know, or built in this year or whatever like that, you'll never get the fruit because the fruit doesn't have a year uh, release year or an engine type. But if you instead go to that same tape, that cars collection and say, give me everything that that's, uh, grows on trees or whatever, then they'll say, oh, you, you want a fruit, right? Because fruit's the only thing that have a grows on uh, field. Cars don't grow on things. Anyway, so yeah, there's no, there's nothing that says it that enforces this. So it's kind of odd because we're used to coming from RDBMS, we expect to have the database enforce some rules on us. MongoDB doesn't do that. It, um, at least not the way we're used to. It doesn't have, there's no, no, there's no concept of a DBA that is deciding how table, how data should be formatted and such like that and enforcing that on the uh, use of the database. In the publisher's books example, the book may have a publisher ID by the publisher, but the publisher may not have a list of book IDs. You could do it that way. So let's say you have a, a collection of books and a collection of publishers. You could have each book could have a, a field that says publisher, and it could be an ID of a publisher. Now, there's nothing that says that publisher exists, but you could have an ID in there, and it's just a big number. That number could be a publisher. It could be a book. Okay. Now, if you designed your system correctly and your program behaves in a logical manner, yes, it makes sense that you would only add a ID for a publisher of a publisher that was in the publisher's table collection. Now, the books, though, could have, or see, the publisher could have an array field that contained an ID, the IDs of every book that had the, that were by that publisher. Now, 
the downside of that is that could be large and every time you added new books that pointed to the publisher, you'd have to go update that particular array, which you could do, or it would be easier just to say, um, I'm going to go grab a publisher out of this um, publisher's collection and then go look for every book that has a publisher ID that matches this publisher. Okay, so that would be the more logical way of doing that. But you could do it either way with MongoDB. Uh, Walter's asking, is it possible to use MongoDB with an OR engine like Aurelius or, or Mwart? So you'd have to check with them. <laughs> uh, I really, I'm not, I'm not familiar with enough with their uh, ORM engines to know if they would work with MongoDB. Yeah, it, it, there, there's, um, I've worked with other databases that are similar. So I'll say it reminds me of uh, Norwegian Verbal, a Fortran-based free text database system. Okay, I've never heard of that one, but there are other, as I've learned more about NoSQL, there's like, oh, I've worked with databases that were this way. I'm trying to, there was one I worked with that was a uh, hierarchical database, if I remember correctly. You could, you didn't have relations between tables, but you instead embedded new data in that. It was by, I think it was by IBM. Anyway, I don't remember anything about it. Anyway, that looks like that's it for our questions. We got 